everyone, and welcome to the second day of the virtual convening, Advancing Criminal Justice Reform Through a 21st Century Latinx Lens, Part 2. My name is Lourdes Rosado, and I have the privilege of serving as President and General Counsel of Latino Justice Pearl Deaf. We are a national Latinx civil rights organization using the tools of litigation, advocacy, and leadership development to create a more just and equitable society. Thank you for participating and sharing your insights and wisdom during this convening thus far. In 2017, Latino Justice became the first national Latinx civil rights organization to create a comprehensive criminal justice pillar that looks at the system through a Latinx lens. The goal of our work is to illuminate on a national scale the harms of the criminal justice system, to educate and mobilize Latinxers to advocate for the decriminalization of our communities, including creating alternative models for public safety and abolishing cages, and to work with our black and brown allies to move our society toward a new vision for criminal justice. Together with our partners, the Drug Policy Alliance, the National Caucus of Hispanic Legislatures, and UCLA LPPI, we are so grateful that all of you, who are civil rights leaders, lawmakers, researchers, and community activists, are participating in this most important conversation, a conversation about the harms of a criminal justice system that is rooted in systemic racism and inequality and wielded as a tool of oppression against black and brown communities. The Latinx perspective is critical to complement and reinforce the movement that has been carried and led by the black community. Our intention is to use this convening as a springboard for creating a collective understanding of the actions needed to limit the harms inflicted on Latinx youth during interactions with different criminal justice institutions, such as police, and correctional systems, to create a paradigm where drug use is usually decriminalized and seen through a public health lens, seek meaningful avenues to decarcerate via community diversion and improved reentry options, and finally, to reduce the criminalization of immigrants. Now, please welcome a fierce leader in the drug policy and criminal justice space, the wonderful executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance, Cassandra Frederic. Cassandra? Um, it is so exciting to be joining forces with you in your new role as president and general counsel at the Latino Justice Pearl Def. We are ecstatic to have you take on this role, and I'm very excited to see the trouble we can put, you know, pull together, which is That's right. some of the stuff we're doing today. Uh, so again, my name is Cassandra Frederic. I, uh, it is an honor to serve as the executive director at Drug Policy Alliance. We have been working with Latino justice for a long time on this particular issue. Um, it was many years ago when we had one of our first meetings, Drug Policy Alliance and Latino justice, to talk about this very question, the question of criminal justice reform and um, the Latinx community. Uh, it has been a great honor to see this conversation grow and actually add textures to things that we didn't start even talking about five years ago. Part of the thing that is really important for me to be here and my colleagues, Jeanette and Maritza and Norma who worked on this is to really elevate the role and the nuances that drug policy places in criminal justice conversations. We are one in the same and drug policy has a particular nuance around autonomy and justice and rights. And these things are really crucial to the work that we do and why it's so important for this conversation to be here um, in, these la in these two days. Part of that is because we know that Latinx and Black folks and th those um, people that are both um, are consistently controlled, right? And they are being controlled throughout multiple systems, not just in the criminal justice system, but in education and housing and public benefits and immigration. No matter where we go, no matter what content, no matter what country, if we are not white, we are controlled. And our purpose and our work is really understanding that we are allowed to do what we 
want to do with our bodies, that we deserve the resources that we need to thrive, and that complex human behaviors is not enough for the ruling class to decide what we get to do. So that is part of the conversation that we're hoping to elevate in this moment as we have these conversations, really elevating the particular distinct experiences that Black and X communities have in navigating drug policy and understanding that while this time is about elevating the Latinx voice, it's not as if the Latinx voice has not always been there. Um, the powers that be, the people that have controlled it, have not always elevated or given it the stage uh, to be a full partner in how we move forward. But our work is truly about a multi-justice liberation and how we build coalitions and collectives um, to really build out a vision that includes all of us, that centers all of us, and that really elevates the need for people who are not white um, to be at the center and to benefit disproportionately from our advancement. So today I'm really excited uh, for the plenary sessions that we're having, especially including working towards collective liberation, multiracial justice reform movement, the anti-Blackness training, um, and then also two panel discussions that I'm particularly excited about, uh, drug decriminalization, promoting health-oriented drug policies, and reimagining systems of enforcement. We'll end the day by laying out key criminal justice priorities that bring Latinx perspectives to a collective action. So I am super excited for us to do this uh, together. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Lourdes. Thank you so much, Cassandra, for sharing your wisdom and getting the second day up to um, a great start. Before we begin our day two plenary session, please join me in thanking the sponsors of our convening, the MacArthur Foundation and Every Town for Gun Safety. In keeping with our theme for today, a multifaceted and multiracial coalition is necessary to effect true transformation of the concept and expression of criminal justice in the United States. Now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Kelly Little Hernandez, who will moderate our day two opening plenary session. Thank you. Good morning, family. I'm Kelly Lytle Hernandez coming to you from Tongva Chumash Gabrielino territory, otherwise known as Los Angeles. And I wanna thank everybody for that wonderful grounding for our conversation this morning, um, this plenary on multiracial solidarity. Um, so thank you for joining us this morning. This discussion, this plenary, we hope will set the stage for a day of exciting sessions and breakout discussions by emphasizing the importance of solidarity-based organizing and identifying alignment across different movements and strategies that we're fighting for racial justice, from decriminalizing immigration to reshaping the narrative around public safety. So what this plenary, plenary seeks to do is um, generate new insights into the following question that often confronts advocates on the front lines. Where does the path to true collective liberation lie? And how can organizers overcome attempts by policymakers to drive wedges between communities by offering support for resources or policies that help advance one goal at the expense of another? The thought leaders you will hear from today represent different backgrounds and approaches to building multiracial, multi-ethnic solidarity in the criminal justice space, and will offer strategic insights around how to form authentic and symbiotic coalitions that propel our collective justice reform movement forward. So I wanna introduce our, our panelists. They are each brilliant, incomparable, and legendary in their own right. First, we have Cristina Jimenez Moreta. She's the co-founder of United We Dream. Cristina is a community organizer, a political strategist, and a storyteller. A co-founder and former executive director of United We Dream, United, um, the largest immigrant youth-led organization in the country. She migrated to the United States from Ecuador with her family at age 13, growing up undocumented. Under Christina's leadership, UWD grew into a powerful network of nearly 1 million members that shifted the policies and the narrative about immigrants and immigration, ultimately delivering policy changes at the local and the national levels. Christina was instrumental in United We Dream's successful campaign for President Obama to sign deferred action for childhood arrivals into law. So welcome, Christina. Thank you for being with us today. 
Our second panelist is Nicole D. Porter, the Senior Director of Policy at the Sentencing Project. Nicole manages the sentencing projects of state and local advocacy efforts on sentencing reform, voting rights, and eliminating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Her advocacy has supported criminal justice reforms in several states, including Kentucky, Missouri, and California. Porter was named a new civil rights leader by Essence Magazine for her work to eliminate mass incarceration. Porter is also the former director of the Texas ACLU's Prison and Jails Accountability Project, there, Porter advocated in the Texas legislature to promote felony enfranchisement reforms, to eliminate prison rape, and to improve the prison medical care system. Welcome, Nicole. And finally, we have Lex Stepling, Director of Campaigns and Policy at Policy, Dignity, and Power Now. Lex has spent his life organizing around issues pertaining to state violence from an abolition and a public health lens. Nationally, Lex has organized a holistic organizing strategy to de-silo the fight to dismantle systems of state violence. His work helped support the repeal of the death penalty in Connecticut, Maryland, and Nebraska, as well as the closure of the House of Corrections Jail in Philadelphia and the rollout of a comprehensive decarceral strategy, which helped to decarcerate the city by 50%. Locally here in Los Angeles, Lex has helped to build the Justice LA Coalition, which successfully stopped LA County's um, planned $4 billion jail expansion. Welcome, Lex. And with those introductions, we will begin our, our conversation this morning. Um, we're gonna start off with a question for everybody. And I'd like to level us with this conversation. Um, how do you each define solidarity and what does it mean to you? Let's begin with Nicole. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's so nice to be in conversation with you all. It's afternoon for me. I know it's morning for you all um, out in California. Um, and I'm coming to you from uh, Piscataway land, also known as Washington, DC. So thank you. Um, you know, for me, in, in response to your question, it's critical to understand the common struggle and common solutions. Um, you know, I think that particularly in the United States, that there are common through lines that, um, you know, can help support a multiracial coalition and multiracial organizing. And how I approach my work specifically is oftentimes looking for the most marginalized and excluded in the struggle, whatever particular struggle I'm entering into. And, you know, working to find solutions um, that bring people in the room and to the table who um, are often the most isolated from those discussions and the most left out of any conversations around power or policy. And, you know, I hope in approaching the work that way and approaching solidarity that way, that that um, helps contribute my thinking to stretching a collective imagination that's inclusive, that's inclusive of everybody and understands, you know, how, what the roots are of the problems we're working to struggle against and challenge on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Christina. You want to follow? Yeah, and it's great um, to be with all of you. Thank you so much for creating the space uh, to both organizations. Um, it's wonderful to be with all of you. Um, Christina Jimenez, she, her pronouns, and um, uh, joining you from New York, uh, Lenata Land. Um, and, you know, to this question of solidarity um, and what it takes, you know, I will say that from um, just like my own practice and like evolving and growing as an organizer um, myself, I think that there's, you know, three things that um, I will lift up uh, that are crucial for those of us uh, building bridges and building solidarity between communities. Um, one is that um, we ought to do the work to have a deep understanding of the legacy and history of white supremacy, anti-Blackness and racism um, in this country and how that has shaped policies, narratives, systems um, that have um, that have had a huge impact in, in how our culture works and how our government works, our policy works. Um, and when you look at examples just like 
how or where, for example, Border Patrol came from. Um, many models um, of oppression um, and criminalization were rooted first in um, tactics that were designed to target uh, Black people in this country. Um, you know, KKK members um, and Texas Rangers and slave patrols were actually founding part of what gave birth to Border Patrol. Uh, and many of those members um, uh, generated the foundation for what we know uh, Border Patrol to be today. Um, so, you know, many of us in our community don't know that. Um, I'm just lifting up that as an example for how important it is to understand um, the deep history and the legacy of white supremacy, anti-Blackness and racism um, in the country to be able to then understand the connections of how those same systems and policies impact um, Latinx communities, API communities, um, et cetera. Um, the second thing that you know I will share is that we um, ought to really be uh, sober about the conflicts um, and the tensions that we have within our own communities of color, uh, whether that is um, anti-Blackness in um, the Latinx community, for example, or uh, anti-Indigenous and anti-API sentiments in our communities. Um, and have those conversations that like we won't be able to move forward in true solidarity if those conversations are not had in our communities and if we don't build those bridges. So really facing uh, and confronting those conversations and having those difficult conversations when we're having our organizing gatherings, our community meetings, when we're developing our campaigns, um, that's what solidarity looks like, actually leaning in into those tensions um, and, and be able to build understanding and solidarity together. Um, and third is that we actually need to move from, you know, a lot of the talking and the understanding of the deep systems to action. Um, and solidarity in action is, um, you know, like what we um, uh, have seen in many communities um, when, um, Black uh, siblings in our communities are targeted by police. Um, when um, you see uh, young uh, Latinx folks being targeted by the, by the police and black, brown communities taking action together. Um, and I know that you know many of us here have been part of those examples locally, whether that has been in New York City or LA or Chicago um, and many other parts of the country. Um, so it's really putting that solidarity into action together um, and putting our bodies on the line together um, for uh, communities of color um, and understanding that, you know, speaking out for Black lives doesn't mean that we're undermining any other community, but that actually um, standing out for Black lives means we're standing for each other and also in centering uh, Black um communities and challenging the anti-blackness and racism that ultimately would build that liberation that you spoke about kelly at the beginning um, in our communities and that could transform narratives debates and policies thank you so much christina lex you want to weigh in on this as well sure um and hi my name is lex stephanie i'm here in la with dignity and power now um I mean, I think everything that we do, certainly when it comes to kind of, you know, the, the work that we're all doing to fundamentally change things for the better, everything that we do is relational. I would say that solidarity to me is about a relationship with what's right. And oftentimes that means relationships with the people carrying that mantle towards what's right. And so, um, what's right can go in and out of style, you know, what's, what's the right thing to do, what's the right analysis, what's correct, what's, what's, you know, what's the, you know, the so-called right side of history, that can go in and out of style. Solidarity to me is holding the line with what's right through thick and thin. That not all relational, not all relationships are unconditional, but a relationship with the truth a relationship with what is just should be unconditional. And to me, that's the true practice of solidarity is being consistent through that. Uh, and that includes during the good times and the bad times, during the times when you're lauded and during the times when you're 
may be undermined or criticized or outnumbered? Yeah, that sounds like some hard earned wisdom right there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to go back to something that I think all of you lifted up one way or another um, and get a little bit deeper with this question. Christina, you had said solidarity in action. And Lex, you're talking about um, what happens when there's pushback and how do you stand strong in relationship to truth, right, or power and challenging it. And Nicole, you talked about prioritizing the most mar marginalized person or peoples in the room. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more. Can you give an example of solidarity in action when you have worked to hold the line or to build a bridge in a particular movement or action? Can you just give us a little insight as to what that's looked like and how you saw your way through that? Um, maybe can we start, we'll go the other direction. Can we start with Lex? So solidarity in, in action. I think, um, I mean, it's such a great question because it, it applies to everything in the, in the micro and the macro. Um, so I, I will try, I think, to quickly answer it in the in a context that, that feels actually kind of easy to answer it right now, which is that there's been a lot of powerful work done by a lot of people to move us away from a generationally normalized system of state violence that's just been extremely brutal and wreaked havoc for all of us and a system you know that people use terms like mass incarceration and police brutality uh, family separation and all of it is a part of this same system i was going to say mechanism but it, it's it's all of the above and we've made a great deal of progress actually and and it's no longer normalized and it's questioned and it's not considered um the default any longer and in some cases we've made ma huge material gains to change it and undo it and we knew that um what was coming next was what you just said kelly which is a backlash and i feel like we are you know chest deep in that backlash right now and I wouldn't even call it a sophisticated backlash or even a strategic backlash. I would also not call it a popular backlash, but it's a political backlash. It's a media backlash. And it's also, I think we're experiencing almost like a war of attrition where it's really prolific. It's a high volume backlash. When we go from a moment where everybody's giving us a high five to a moment where the backlash is in full effect. Um, and I'm saying backlash, but again, I feel like I want to be so explicit in saying it's not a popular backlash. Um, you guys might even be able to hear the helicopters behind me. I'm right here in South Central LA, where a community that gets used as an example all the time. Um, you know, our abolitionist principles are certainly not unpopular here in the community by any stretch. But when that backlash happens, <clears throat> when the sense of momentum changes that's when a lot of people come to somebody like me and everybody else here and say it's time to maybe water down the message or it's time to change the message or don't say what you mean because we want to reach the people in the middle the center and i have so much to say about that what i actually think about that but instead of digressing in that direction which is so tempting and i do kind of hope we all get to touch on it a little bit what I'll say is that solidarity in action <clears throat> is saying we are not going to do anything but tell the truth. The idea of strategy is often misunderstood to mean that we are somehow social engineers or, um, you know, programming people or tricking people into siding with us. Um, the reason we win campaigns is because all we do is tell the truth. Uh, we have to be accountable. We're never going to have the resources. I don't think of the of the status quo that we're trying to transform away from what we have is people people are more powerful than anything but an animated activated critical mass of people to help bring about these changes that are so important to us and to our future generations only happens when people trust that we're always telling the truth so solidarity and action is a commitment to the truth through thick and thin and 
hopefully when people come and say, maybe change the message, water down the message, etc. We're not alone when we say, no, we're not going to do that. We're supported when we say, no, we're not going to do that. We are going to tell the truth, whether you feel like it's comfortable or challenging or not. And we also know that that means sometimes we're going to get blamed for things that are not our fault because we told the truth, which might be a theme in all walks of life. Thank you for that. Christina, do you have some wisdom you want to share with us that was earned in building, you know, solidarity and action across communities? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, it takes vulnerabil vulnerability to also say when we are wrong um, and when we, um, when people in our communities, um, for example, in the context of immigrant justice um, and the immigrant justice movement and for folks you know, who are joining us, um, this will resonate like for a long time in the immigrant um, justice movement, folks didn't want to touch the conversation about the fact that this is, fund you know, our system is fundamentally racist and the anti-blackness within the system. Um, and, um, and, and I think that that actually created a lot of harm um, in um, the immigrant justice movement, in Black immigrant communities, and also it was harmful and, and it was preventing building true solidarity with other communities of color. Um, but if we, if we don't acknowledge that, like, you know, that that, that is true, that that, that's a, that, that is um, a flaw in, in, in the movements, in the coalitions, um, that 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 we have formed over the years and you know i just joined the movement in the early 2000s post 9 11 when everyone wanted to actually take a frame on immigration of getting right with the law to talk about immigration as opposed to calling it for what it was which is you know racist policies rooted in anti-blackness and white supremacy uh but that was not a popular message to the point that you know lex was raising about popularity or not like at the time post 9 11 Folks didn't want to talk about that, especially not in the immigrant justice movement, right? So I think um, I think that being able to challenge those, accept that those were uh, that 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 was wrong, and that that has been flaw in our movements, and own up to those mistakes, and then do the work to heal those mistakes, to fix that, to rebuild, uh, and to build new conversations. You know, I don't, I don't want to say that it's fully done, that we have done all the work, and certainly I'm not the only person that has been part of this work. But I, I've seen a change in the last, you know, uh, close to 20 years that I've been involved in immigrant justice organizing, and that's change being led by also, you know particularly young people and black young people, uh, black immigrant uh, folks um, that have really pushed the conversation, confronted the anti-blackness, even in the formations of our own coalitions in, in movement. Um, and, you know, the one way that I will share that that, how that work has manifested um, is, um, you know, I remember when we were going through the moment of, of the uprising of the movement for black lives largest you know uh, movement in the history of this country and at the same time the supreme court was preparing to release a decision on daca uh, that impacts um you know certainly uh black and brown uh immigrants um but but traditionally those spaces and those movement conversations have been separate they've happened in isolation and through the relationship building that's happened through the uh, in the last couple of years through the work uh, of organizations like Undocu Black and United We Dream that have really forged more conversations and more strategic spaces, both um, organizations, for example, came together to say, we're not gonna be divided and we actually going to coalesce with the Movement for Black Lives and, and the Movement for Black Lives Table who was um, leading a lot of the efforts during the uprising. Um, and we came together on conference calls, on learning sessions, and, and, and more practically to actually put communications together, to hold pressers together, to make sure that this court, the Supreme Court decision was not going to use to divide, you know, the DACA impact of folks versus the, uh, the beautiful uprising and protest that we were seeing demanding justice for black lives, but that we were actually in the movement for black lives and together also holding the, the attacks on immigrant communities from the Trump administration um, and from a potential you know, negative Supreme Court decision. Um, and those conversations, you know, if it was like early 2000s, 
had probably not happened. Um, that unity, that strategic unity, the intentionality to not uh, repeat mistakes um, was in, we had that intervention because of the work that we've done in the past. So I just want to lift that up as moments where we've actually seen the work pay off um, and, you know, as we go into the conversation, we'd love to touch more about like a moment that we're in when they are also attacking our communities and blaming us um, for um, a messaging that doesn't work for elections. And as we go into the midterm elections, I think it's so important to talk about, you know, how that unity and solidarity comes into action. You know, Christina, I always love hearing you speak for, for many reasons, one of them being that your deep appreciation and leveraging of history, right, and how it's the foundation of some of our struggles and the Black freedom struggle in particular. Um, and to this issue, I got to say, I've been in this movement um, since about 1990 and doing work on the Black freedom struggle, but also immigrant rights. And it used to be totally separate spheres, right, and even combative. But as you say, over the last 20 years, the work that you and others have led has allowed us to find the shared spaces to be in struggle together. So much love and appreciation to all that um, ground level work. Nicole, you've got so much experience working with incarcerated populations and policy. You want to share some wisdom with us about building solidarity? Definitely. And I think building off of the comments that have already been shared, I remember back in the mid 2000s uh, working in Texas when the organizing uh, started surfacing around Hutto um, and being at the table when some of the first organizing discussions, uh, you know, were getting started around trying to shut down um, a prison that was working to disappear mothers and their babies um, behind the walls, a, a prison that had held folks in the criminal legal system prior uh, to you know, being transformed into this lockup that held uh, parents with their young children. You know, in hearing the comments um, already, I was in a discussion earlier this week where we are currently in the midst of a backlash that's attempting to find a way forward as though as though the weight of history isn't with us in the room, you know, engaged with advocates who are trying to get a voting rights bill through and think that they can do that without talking about race, as though the entire way of who gets a voice in this country is not rooted in white supremacy, has not been about excluding those marginalized perspectives that I mentioned when, in my earlier comments when talking about solidarity. And people think uncritically that they're going to be able to do that because of the white fragility that has surfaced um, in the last couple of years. It is all out of a playbook of from history, from the early 2000s, when the culture wars were about something else. They were about abortion. They were about gay marriage. And now in 2022, it's about critical race theory and some ongoing backlash against the first black president, against a growing multiracial democracy. So this conversation is right on time. And, you know, from my days in the mid 2000s and joining this protest at Hutto, what got me to those protests was understanding the harm done with locking anyone up for any amount of time. The politicization that I went through and knowing how um, incarceration impacted my whole family, messed my whole family up. My twin brother was locked up in his early 20s. That had ripple effects up until my mother's death because she mortgaged her house to pay for his um, legal fees. And that, and this, that essentially sunk her into poverty that really compromised her ability um, to tap into you know, resources that she thought she had accumulated and that she could count on later in life. This system breaks everybody down. And the only way through that is going to be through creating some space where we all understand the mutual conditions that lead to the, that lead to the struggle, that understand the white supremacist capitalist um, policies and, and practices that reinforce 
isolation and marginalization. And we identify solutions that work through that. So my solidarity in action was the politicization that got me to those tables in 2006. And that has continued to influence my perspective around these issues and understanding that there are bigger forces at play. And the way to counter those forces is to figure out some way to work on them together, to work on countering them together. And I don't want to like kumbaya too much, but there, you know, there are bigger, there are bigger things, there are bigger issues that the only way to identify the solutions through them and to stretch our, ima our imaginations um, to address them is going to be an understanding history understanding how the roots of history get us to where we are today and understanding how the interest in leaning into some white fragility, given the white supremacist roots in this country, isn't going to be the solution. And so we have to figure that out together and continue discussions like this, figure out practical ways in the short term, but also visionary ways in the long term, you know, because this country is in the midst of a change and there's a backlash right now to try to prevent it from happening. And that's just, you know, try to do it, you know, capture it as succinctly as possible. That's what's, you know, there are some big forces that we're all working um, to address here. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, I love the way everyone keeps coming back to history, right? So let's, I'd love to lean into that a little bit and have a little bit of a conversation about um, storytelling and the history is that created the conditions that you say, Nicole, that we all share and that we're all struggling against. Um, I'm wondering if you all can share with us some of the historical episodes or knowledge that you find vital to make sure your communities know about other communities and how they, relate, how they are related to us um, and how our struggles have been braided together across time. So earlier, Christina gave us the example that when you're talking about the Border Patrol, it's critical to know where the Border Patrol comes from and the importance of the, the Texas Rangers and the KKK and in their founding and their founding members. And I'm wondering if there's other historical episodes, vignettes that you find critical to share um, for people to begin to pull together a shared understanding of who we are as a people in struggle, right? So, you know, for example, one of the things I often talk about is how in 1896, the Supreme, same Supreme Court that issued the Plessy v. Ferguson ruling, which established Jim Crow America, is the same Supreme Court who created immigrant detention. So the mind and the mindset that creates the conditions of our lives is the same, right? We've often seen them as being in silos, that we have different struggles, but in fact, you trace them back far enough, they all go to the same place. And it's this white supremacist settler route, right? So I'm sure you're sharing wisdom with your communities all the time and you're using history. And I'm wondering if there's any other stories you want to make sure people who are listening and now are aware of that they can share along with their communities as well. Could I maybe go to, to Lex first? Um, well, I mean, you already know, Kelly, how much I love framing things this way and especially being able to talk to you in this space. You, uh, you're one of my very favorite writers who writes about LA. Um, and when writing about LA, LA has always been, or at least in my lifetime, very much a microcosm for what happens in the rest of the country and also a workshop for what happens in the rest of the country. And that's resonating very much listening to Nicole talk about advocates going to the state house or advocating federally saying we have to uh, tailor our message to the very people who um, want us to regress as a country. We are on the verge of lots of changes. In fact, we are in those changes. So what I would say is that I think a lot of people feel like they're on the verge of those changes. And it's kind of like when somebody's leaving a bad relationship, there's an impulse to regress back into it because even if it's bad, it's comfortable. I do think there's some of that happening. But it's interesting to hear Nicole say that um, that people are still saying that all these years later. I mean, my whole life, I've had people say, oh, no, you have to do that. You have to tailor your message to the conservatives. You have to tailor your message to the white moderate. You have to tailor your message to, you know, the opposition, etc. And real quick, I mean, what's interesting about that is that you don't get to tailor a message and then not have to do 
what you just said you're going to do. So really what they're saying to you is just please maintain the status quo, even if it's hurting you, even if it's killing you, even if it's destroying your community, it makes them uncomfortable. So actually when you're advocating, advocate to change nothing. And then maybe we win. And I don't even know what that means anymore because what is a win? I, I that's the that's the question I I plan to ask the next time someone brings that to me is well what what is winning then? Um, and so I think as far as the historical framing is concerned, I know for 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 Los Angeles, for example, we are from the outside seen as this very liberal city in a very liberal state. And it coincides with also being the largest incarcerating county and the largest incarcerating state and the largest incarcerating country on the planet. And no metro jurisdiction in the whole world jails more people than LA. And up until a couple of years ago, up until this recent DA's election, Los Angeles County is a county every year handed out more death sentences than the whole state of Texas. We still lead the country in incarceration, even with the progress we've made, even with our numbers much lower than they were just a couple of years ago, we still lead the country. And there's a reason for that. I mean, there are many reasons for that. But one of the reasons is that LA is a demographically progressive place. It's full of progressive minded people. But I would argue that so is the rest of the country. The institutions in California, especially Southern California, and I don't use this word lightly because, because I, I, especially in this context, want to be clear on how specific I'm being and how literal I'm being. Our institutions were built by white supremacists in California. Our sheriff's department, our police department, our, our housing laws, our public health institutions, our infrastructure institutions were built by people who when they were settling Los Angeles about, you know, 150 years later, decided that LA was going to be the capital of the kind of manifest destiny, Western fantasy of a white supremacist beacon on the hill. And I'm not making that up. And I'm so glad that Kelly's here because Kelly can confirm that that was very openly the plan. And that's who designed our institutions. And that is in part why when then they needed labor from everywhere else, uh, we became the first place to really invest in a militarization of our police force. And there's many iterations of that. The, the most recent legacy that I think applies to us now is the legacy of police chief William Parker and the legacy of, of Sheriff Sherman Block, where they very openly leaned into a militaristic um kind of cult like cult of violence culture in our police forces and subsequently having a not to say that corrections departments are good but we don't even have one the sheriffs run the jails here in la we as a result have the most militarized police force the largest probation department the largest sheriff's department and the most um i'd say highest per capita investment in weaponry and things like that including the use of helicopters which literally is circling over my head right now at 9 44 a.m here in south central los angeles and the point that i'm making with that is that that contrast there's been a failure to articulate that contrast and so we often get victimized as people here by the notion that that's a liberal place and in liberal los angeles they still believe in mass incarceration and violent policing and it subsequently gets normalized as, as a kind of centrist ideal when in fact it is so so completely um dissonant from what the actual community wants and experiences here which is why we are also historically the place where things have erupted where radical demands have been born where an innovation around organizing has been born and those parallel things are so important to always consistently name and it's also so important to consistently and it goes back to my point about solidarity reject the idea that we do anything but demand what's right for the community. And when we do that, we actually win. And we are winning in Los Angeles, but of course it's not easy. And that legacy of hyperviolence is still happening. Los Angeles Police Department shot uh, seven people uh, in the first week of January. All of them, uh, Latinos, by the way, shot seven people. The 77th Division, and, and, I, and I'll stop because I want to be brief and respect everyone's time, but this is important. The 77th Division Police Department right here in South Central LA, the other day flew their pirate flag, their Jolly Roger flag, which is a death squad flag. 
They threw it up to signal to the community that this means war because an officer was killed in unincorporated Southeast LA uh, last week. So now they're green lighting people. Now they're pulling people off the street. Uh, we've had more shootings, um, a relative, I'll be more open. My brother was beaten yesterday by the police because they went into the building he was in and beat him and robbed him. And right now we're telling our own people just stay off the street right now because the, the relationship policing has with the community here um, is so violent to the point that telling the truth about it can be overwhelming for people because it's stranger than fiction. And that to me is a really important historical frame that there's a legacy of ultra violence. You know, we've seen the movie Clockwork Orange, except for it's done by the state. There's a legacy of ultra violence here. And it's very important to never shy away from naming it as it is and then demanding something completely and entirely different rather than a kind of impulse to do a kind of genteel liberal framing of the issue of saying, well, people want police if police did good. But that's just as much of a fantasy as anything else. And what people want is to be safe. And everybody, no matter where they live on the ideological spectrum, wants to be safe. And they want their future generations to have opportunity. That's what we all want. And policing in this country is very much antithetical to safety. And anytime someone tells me stop saying that or don't say defund or whatever, I'm like, hey, I didn't make these things up. These are not novel ideas. We are simply telling the truth. And in telling the truth, it opens up a political home for people to come and be in. And that's why whenever it's time to vote, we win in LA. The polling may not be accurate because they'll tell us we're unpopular, but when it's time to vote, we win. And that's because we have an animated base that is appreciative and grateful that everybody's out here constructing that political home that is actually about what people are experiencing. So I appreciate the question. The framing of history is such a rich and important thing. I appreciate your work so much, Kelly, around helping articulate that and give us text to point to. And it's also really challenging to have to say it because it sounds crazy. It does. Yeah, um, I think that's so right. I want to speak to what you just said about the extraordinary violence and really bring it home to the conversation we're having here today around Latinx communities and multiracial organizing. Um, one of the things you said, Lex, about the importance of ripping off the blinders, right, and talking about the violences that we're experiencing on a daily basis. And one of the things I find when I speak across the country is that um, people have no idea how much violence Latinx communities from the police have experienced here in this country. And one, two of the stories I find to be quite powerful to tell are about um, two massacres that occurred in the United States that targeted um, Latinx communities, Mexican and Mexican American in particular. And the first is probably the largest race riot and massacre in US history that we never talk about. And that's in the summer of 1915, a group of Mexican immigrants in Texas tried to start a rebellion against white supremacy. It was called a Plan de San Diego. And they actually organized an, an army of a multiracial army of African-Americans, indigenous folks and Asian folks to um, eject settlers out of Texas. And the settler response was brutal and it was vicious. And Historians estimate that anywhere between 300 and 5,000 Mexicans were lynched in South Texas between 1915 and 1918 in retaliation for a multiracial solidarity movement against white supremacy. And those are the kinds of stories we have to remember about the violence, but also that we've been doing this multiracial solidarity work for a very, very long time. We've been finding our ways together. Um, the second is a, a set of lynchings that happened in 1918 called El Porvenir, in which about 18 Mexicans were lynched by the Texas Rangers again. Um, we got to start talking about the history of racial violence and how it's impacted Latinx communities and that policing today is the legacy of that, that racial violence, just as it's been for, for Black and Indigenous communities. So I don't know, Nicole or Christina, if you wanted to weigh in on this particular question about historical legacies and multiracial organizing. Um, I'll just quickly say that, and you know, Christina brought up um, the through line of anti-blackness and how you, you know that reality needs to be part of the organizing and needs to be part of the multiracial analysis that's driving coalition and solidarity. And I'll just say that, particularly in um, the context of the criminal legal system, crime did increase 
in the 70s and 80s that you know created a pretext for disappearing black and brown folks behind prison walls. But that was a choice that the United States made because of the centering of anti-blackness as part of its crime response policy, which is about policy and practice and power and social control. Other countries, white, um, you know, white majority countries did not respond with the carceral Marshall Plan the way the United States did. So in order to counter the forces that, um, you know, continue to marginalize racial and ethnic minorities in this country, it will be around that multiracial coalition building and multiracial solidarity. And then also to understand how the roots of this country reinforce themselves. It was slavery. It was, um, you know, disappearing people from their lands. It was Jim Crow. It's mass incarceration. It's criminalizing border crossing. It's over policing in communities. And this country is making a choice around that, that centers white supremacy in driving those decisions and driving those policies. And other countries that have grappled with similar problems, but isn't about a white minority trying to socially control its racial and ethnic communities have made different choices around that. So I just think that that's going to be clear. The lessons from history are going to be drawn upon, particularly as we move forward off of this conversation and continue to enter into spaces around um, solidarity and multiracial organizing. I shared, I'm going to tweet out in a, a case study, there's a question in the, in the comments, what are some specific um, case studies or examples of multiracial organizing. I want to draw people's attention to the Hutto organizing that I mentioned earlier. There's some stuff written up about it. I'll share it out over Twitter in reaction to the Twitter thread and then, you know, look forward to continuing to find ways to connect with folks who are in the audience and all, you know, Christine, Alex, and you, Kelly, around this as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is so rich and I think, um, you know, Kelly, Lex, Nicole, like all, there's just so many examples, both to learn how, like why supremacy keeps using the same tools that are designed to like target black folks to then making it broader um, for other communities, um, but also examples of where we've come together. And I feel like, you know, I'm not from California, but um, one, of the, one of the things that I've used a lot in the work of organizing and even just like learning is looking at Proposition 187 and where did that come from in California? Um, and to understand like the politics and the history of that moment, I mean, you first have Ronald Reagan and Republicans in California, you know, by basically launching a campaign against black people around welfare reform. And, um, you know, the, the narratives around welfare queens and black folks taking advantage of the system of the government um, becomes then a narrative that then was used to also target immigrants, Mexican API folks in California, um, and, and making the same claims that immigrant folks, undocumented folks and documented folks uh, again, you know, sometimes also people try to create division between the people that have papers and the people that don't have papers like that's and that's how white supremacy works. But in this particular example, it was like, you know, all immigrants with papers, without papers are taking advantage. But it was because of these narratives and policy attacks around welfare reform that then uh, Proposition 187 that wanted to uh, basically ban, um, you know, undocumented immigrants from going to the schools, ban services, uh, having citizenship requirements for services, for school use, for transportation use, for healthcare access. Um, that, that was really a model uh, that came from uh, how um, white supremacists, racist politicians drove attacks first around the black community and, and crafting policy around welfare reform that then expanded to something like Proposition 187. But the really, um, but the really cool thing that happens is that this is when communities of color in California came together and they were like, oh hell no. And they worked together to organize people, to get people to get involved in the elections. And every every history analysis tells you that that was a pivotal point 
passage of welfare reform in the state of California, and then Proposition 187, which, by the way, was voted in favor by, by California voters. It was actually adopted, but then challenged in the court. But when people saw this, they came together to organize, and that's a pivotal point that led to electoral organizing, issue-based organizing between communities, um, all communities of color coming together to say, we're going to hold these politicians accountable. And, and you can look at history and look how that moment then shape the electoral map and who holds power in the legislature in California, but also how communities of color form multiracial coalitions to vote people out and to vote people that align with their values. Um, and this is why, you know, California leads on many of immigration policies that are actually um, you know, inclusive and that are aligned with racial justice and racial equity. So um, I think that that's just like one you know, historical example, both of like where our communities were attacked, but also came together. Um, and you know, I haven't seen these yet like come into a fruition at the national level, but I think that I see some hopeful um, examples, you know, some of the questions folks are like wanting to hear more examples of what's happening now. Um, you know, another point of history is that, you know, after California passes welfare reform and, and Reagan launches his campaign to become president, now his fight against black communities and wanting to reform, uh, you know, welfare moves to the national level. And Republicans take that opportunity to then uh, create the conditions for something like welfare reform to be passed. Um, but also for then Clinton to build up on that um, and not only pass the crime bill, but also the 1996 laws that increased criminalization against immigrant communities um, that basically um, put a steroids on what we know as the immigrant detention system right now. Um, so you have these two bills that are passed by a Democratic administration building upon these narratives that, you know, brown and black people are, are abusing the system and the black and brown people uh, need an approach of tough, um, you know, tough on the uh, of uh, law and being tough, right, uh, and law and order. And these frameworks led to these national federal policies that actually led to increased incarceration, increased detention for immigrants, and increased deportation for folks. Um, and now you have coalition spaces that are actually trying to get rid of those policies at the national level, of black and brown folks that are forming coalitions at the national level to fight um, against the crime bill and to also get rid of the 1996 laws. And those conversations are actually happening with folks in the criminal justice space, in the immigrant space, black and brown communities um, that are coming together to challenge those policies. So, you know, we have yet to see some of the like policy outcomes, but the work that is acknowledging the history uh, by design, but also the power that communities have in coming together to fight these laws and to expose how there's no coincidence that these two laws were passed by the same administration at the same time um, that created profits for corporations incarcerating our people um, and that attacked citizens and non-citizens alike. Okay, you just dropped a mic. I love it, that was wonderful. So I think that that was a perfect segue to the next conversation um, at noon. We're wrapping up this, this panel in a moment, but at noon, I want everyone to know that there's gonna be the policy priority breakout. As Christina said, we haven't quite seen the policy wins, but we're gonna create the blueprint for that win in this next breakout session together. Um, you can get to that by going to the reception area and then clicking on sessions at 12 p.m. Um, Pacific or 3 p.m. Eastern. And then the next session after that will be the fireside chat building off of what we just talked about, tackling anti-Blackness in the Latino community. You can access that plenary by heading to the reception area and clicking on the stages to enter the main stage. I want to thank Nicole, Christina, and Lex for this incredible conversation. What I've pulled from it is a couple of things. One is we all need to know Black history. We can't move forward without knowing Black history. We need to do that together and tell the stories together. Uh, by going back to the root, we can stay radical, right, Lex, and keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible and keep imagining beyond what we think is possible. And the critical importance of staying united and staying together because we have a shared struggle. Um, so I want to thank you all for lifting up these important lessons and your wisdom. And um, 
thank everybody else for joining us. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with everybody throughout this convening. Blessings to all. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.